So, hi, um, I'm presenting by HRF, as uh, he already said. Uh, this package has been developed in France at INRIA and CEA in collaboration with the uh, Grenoble Institute of Neuroscience and the uh, University Hospital uh, Grenoble Alps. So uh, what we want to analyze is functional MRI data, and the way that we uh, acquire this data is with an MRI scanner. So a person is placed in the scanner, and uh, she or he performs an experiment that con uh, consists of tasks or stimulus that have been designed to um, generate different kind of brain activity. So while this is happening, the MRI scanner is getting measures that are images that evolve across time. So we get like a video of the brain. And um, the kind of uh, one uh, kind of signal of functional MRI uh, signal is a bolt for blood oxygen level dependent, and is very commonly used because it's non-invasive. Uh, so we don't need to inject any kind of contrast agent. And what we see uh, with uh, the bolt signal is where uh, blood goes after uh, brain activity happens, because it uses hemoglobin as a as a natural tracer. So what we really see uh, with the bold effect is the changes in ratio between uh, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. There are the two states of hemoglobin when they are carrying or not oxygen. And these two states of hemoglobin have different uh, magnetic properties. So changes in this ratio uh, will cause local magnetic uh, disturbances that um, the uh, uh, MRI scanner will detect. So these ratio changes, for example, when there's brain activity, because there's uh, oxygen consumption, and then there's an inflow of oxygenated blood to provide uh, oxygen to the brain tissue. And this makes the ball signal uh, change. So all these physiological processes happening at the same time, and um, we usually describe uh, these changes uh, with the so-called hemodynamic response function that you can see here, uh, the shape. So uh, the part that we are, so ball signal is, is a very noisy signal, and the part that we are interested in is the stimulus-induced induced part, that is, uh, so the variations that will happen uh, after uh, brain activity happens. So we know the hemodynamic response function, I told you, so how uh, hemodynamics will change in time after a stimulus or a task is done. And we know uh, the timings of the stimulus that here are encoded in X. So for example, X0 is a visual stimulus, it's a checkerboard, uh, and X1 would be uh, pressing a button, so a motor um, stimulus uh, task. So how, the way we model this, the signal is uh, doing the convolution between these uh, response functions and the timings. And we do this because we don't want to look at the signal when the events happen. We want to look at the signal when, when we will see a change in the, in the bold effect. And this will be uh, some seconds later. So we want to measure the amplitude of the signal in these points uh, when the signal peaks. Uh, besides this stimulus-induced part, there's also uh, drifts and noise that we model and that we want to remove from the signal. So the classical way of analyzing uh, BOLT is by fixing this hemodynamic response function to a canonical shape that has been described in the literature. And uh, this way, this problem becomes linear, and we can uh, solve it with a general linear model and apply classical statistics. And another model that we can use is the joint detection estimation. That is the, the model that we um, uh, present in the VHRF toolbox. And uh, with the joint detection estimation, we want to, uh, besides measuring the amplitude of the, of the effect, estimating uh, the this hemodynamic response function. And we, do it, uh, we use a Bayesian framework for that that allows us to account for uh, prior knowledge and to constrain the estimation. So we do it uh, regionally because it's computationally expensive. Uh, so we use, uh, we use a parcellation, and for each parcel, we estimate an HRF and all the parameters. And this way, we reduce uh, degrees of freedom. So we have a more robust estimation. From a computational point of view, the load, dec the load decreases a lot. And uh, so as a recommendation, we use parcels of around 100 voxels that are functionally relevant. So we assume that they will have the same shape. 
We introduced some priors, for example, on the activation levels to enforce spatial smoothness, because we know that neighboring voxels will have a similar signal. Um, and we model it uh, with a Gaussian mixture model, considering uh, two classes, active and inactive voxels. And uh, these are conditional to some assignment labels. And uh, there are models through a Markov random field. And this is the way we uh, enforce special smoothness. And on the temporal functions, uh, we want to enforce temporal smoothness because physiologically we know that the response will be smooth. So we constrain the second derivative of the HRF through its covariance matrix. And here uh, I show some examples of smooth uh, priors. So we have our variation framework and our priors. And the way we solve it is a, with a variational expectation maximization. Um, in which we uh, uh, iteratively maximize a, a cost function, that it's a negative free energy, and we do it in two steps. Uh, so in one step, we compute the probability distributions of the variables that we want to get, and in another step, we compute the parameters of the, of the model. And we do this until uh, everything stabilizes. So since we get outputs that are probability distributions, we can get uh, posterior probability maps that reflect the likelihood that an effect is present as opposed to uh, the statistical parametric maps that are delivered by uh, GLM that reflect uh, the probability of observing the data in the absence of any effect. So uh, from a package point of view, we have PyHRF and we, uh, the inputs that we have to um, use are, so we input the bold volume, the experimental paradigm, there are the events, uh, of our tasks or stimulus and the parcellation, and we will get that as outputs, uh, so one hemodynamic response function per parcel, uh, effect maps, uh, brain effect maps, uh, one per experimental condition, and also posterior probability maps uh, per experimental condition. Uh, okay, so we provide a notebook that, I don't know if it's available, it's uh, on this link. And I'm not going to go through all of it because it's, it's very long. Uh, we tried to, um, to show uh, how to use it from the fetching of the data until we get uh, results. So we, go, uh, we get um, data from open fMRI that uh, they have fMRI data publicly available. Um, we also provide a workflow for the reprocessing of the data, so um, it's quite standard. We use SPM uh, through NiPipe, and uh, the only difference with a, a, a pipeline that you would use with the classical GLM is that uh, we don't want to use smooth data because we are modeling it uh, in our algorithm, so we shouldn't pre-smooth. Um, so we do the loading of the inputs, so the bold uh, volume, the parcellation uh, that we should make sure that it's aligned with our 4D volume, and uh, also the, the experimental paradigm. Uh, before running PyHRF, we need to um, set some uh, parameters. So uh, first, uh, estimate HRF uh, should be true. If you want to estimate, you can also not do it. Um, the zero constraint, uh, what it means is that uh, we constrain the first and the last points of the HRF to be zero, uh, which is recommended. Uh, HRF duration, usually we, we use 25 seconds. Uh, the time resolution of the HRF, um, so we recommend to use the TR, which is the, the, um, the time between uh, two time points of our uh, bolt signal. Uh, divided by two, but you can change it. The only thing is that you will have more parameters. If you uh, use a very low time resolution, you will have a lot of parameters and it will be very computationally expensive. As for the algorithm, so sigma h is the initialization of the prior variance of the HRF. And HRF hyper prior, is, we recommend to use 1000. It's for uh, enforcing smoothness of the temporal uh, response. Uh, if you put zero, you won't uh, enforce it, but we recommend 1,000. And beta is a parameter uh, of the spatial uh, correlation. You can choose to use cosine or polynomial drift, but we recommend cosine. So then uh, we can run PyHRF and 
it takes some time. Then uh, for the visualization of the outputs, we usually use uh, Nylearn. Um, in the uh, in the notebook, you can find a function that is find ppm maps, so it, it finds you the results, and uh, we use we can plot uh, these ppms uh, with a using a ppm threshold, and compare it to the z scores that are um, saved in NeuroVault. So NeuroVault is a site where you where uh, the statistical maps are saved, and uh, these ones are for GLM, and you, we see that um, they have. Um, well, the posterior probability map gives activations that are uh, smaller. Also, our data hasn't been uh, previously smoothed, so. Okay, and we can also find the um, activated parcels by thresholding the, these PPM maps. And we uh, here we plot uh, the HRFs estimated in these um, active parcels. Okay, so uh, to summarize, um, PyHRF is a Python library for the analysis of fMRI data based on the study of uh, hemodynamics. Um, here you have the website if you want to check. And uh, so it's quite computationally expensive, so um, it's not widely used. And so when to use it is uh, when we want to explore HRF variability. So here in the example that I have shown, um, the design was block, and it, it usually works better with event-related designs because you uh, can see the shapes of the HRF much more clearer in the signal, but it can also work with block designs. And uh, in this case, if the blocks are short and um, a lot of them, it will be better. So uh, we can use it uh, when we suspect that the HRFs may be different from the uh, canonical shape as it could be in aging populations or in some diseases, as stenosis. Um, when we are interested in the modeling of the smoothness intrinsically and avoid pre-smoothing, so usually in GLM we pre-smooth data with a Gaussian uh, kernel and it's quite uh, rough and here we are modeling the, the smoothness inside our algorithm, so that's quite interesting, but this is what makes the algorithm very computationally expensive. Um, Okay, and also if we are interested in using a probabilistic approach and getting probabilistic outputs as the posterior probability maps that I showed. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Um, so, in what I would be looking at is the the blobs on the left side, mm -hmm. right? And uh, okay, the activation is is smaller. I don't know if it's because of the PPM threshold, um, or because of the smoothing. I'm not sure, yeah. but slower. I um. Smaller uh, clusters doesn't mean that it performs worse. It might be that it performs better, actually. You would need a, a data set where you have a ground truth to, to actually determine that. Like, you, have, you need to try to make like, a synthetic data set and try to see whether like, the content is better. Um, so we use synthetic data sometimes. And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't compared. But so the, the, usually we compare to GLM because it's the, the standard. And uh, they are not uh, completely comparable, the, the maps, because they, uh, they give completely different things. But they are approximate. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the smoothing take ta takes time, but uh, what takes the most is the, uh, the estimation of the hemodynamic response function. Because you have, so if you want to estimate, uh, you, you have 25 seconds, uh, 50 parameters more to estimate. algebra, do you have sampling, do you 
what makes, what are the, is it, do you have to do massive convolutions? What, what really is the, uh, the bottleneck in terms of that? I'm not sure. <laughs> so it's the estimation. Uh, MCMC, we also have an implementation in NCMC, and it takes much more time. But VEM, it's actually quite fast. Can you say a word about um, the community? Like, how many people are involved in core development and stuff like that? Okay, so this is a package that uh, is really, really research-oriented. So usually there is uh, one PhD working on it, and now there's one engineer, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's it's but, not very much used. But you welcome contributions. Yeah, yeah, we welcome very much contributions. I have one more question. Right. I'm actually very interested in this. I work with mouse data and RA for SMB, RA for SMB, and then for Mm -hmm. what, yeah. what input parameters do you have here to like put some prior knowledge or expectations on the approximate shape in the model? So I explained uh, the priors. I'm not sure your, what is your question. So <laughs> Sorry. As a prior, can you like put a weight data there, like a function of UC, so that you say I expect it to look somewhat like this? Yeah, so you could, for example, here, uh, you mean in the HRF? So here we are just as, um, imposing smoothness in the, so it's through the covariance matrix, you see in R, uh, but you could also give a mean. Like the mean is zero, but you could uh, give a shape and say, okay, you, you have to be close to this shape. But this prior is for smoothness, so you are just saying that um, uh, consecutive points don't have to vary a lot. Uh, like the second derivative of consecutive points, uh, you know. okay. So I can say something like, well, I expect this to be a gamma function or a beta function or, or yeah. a gamma function or a beta function. Yeah. You can say that. It's a variation framework, so yeah, you can give priors for all your parameters. I'm not sure you understood, or maybe we can talk later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>